How are we doing, Rock Church? We good? We awake. Happy August. Uh, excited to be here and share this morning. We're opening up a new series called If You Only Knew, Rediscovering the Power of the Gospel. Um, something I really want to just highlight here is I know right around August, September, New families start to come in, check out our church, summer's over, kids are going back into school. I uh, just want to just kind of preface a couple things. Number one, you're going to come in on a Sunday and worship is a priority for us. It's really important for us to encounter God's presence and that the band is not the focal point, but Jesus is. So I just really want to let you, kind of invite you in behind the curtain and the veil. What I love with what Sam and Eden are doing and, and Ben and Shalisa Horvat, as, as they're leading us in this worship community, God has stripped down the team and we have musicians coming in and going out, people that moved. But we said, you know what? We really want our focus to not be about how good the music is or how big the band can sound how great our God is and how worthy of praise he is. And that's our goal. So this morning when you saw that, you're like, man, when's this going to end? Guess what? We don't know either. <laughs> There's no, we have an agenda. If you ever come down the front row, you might see this run sheet. We kind of set that to the side because our goal is we're not going to put Jesus on a clock. The Holy Spirit is not on a timer where we say, okay, hey, you got to show up in the next seven minutes here, God. And hopefully, hopefully you'll show up at right on time. Uh, but secondly, we really, we really go into our message series and we, and we pray and we're asking the Holy Spirit, God, what are you speaking to his church? And, and he just highlighted this theme of the gospel. And I, I'm just so blessed and honored by this team. We have an incredible team that comes here and teaches. And I, I just want to be honest that there is this pressure to perform in modern preaching. And if you go online right now, you can hear the greatest communicators in the world in a second. Back in the day when I first started preaching, there was no YouTube. There were no podcasts. You were just a good preacher in town. Now you're compared against the greatest preachers in the world. But here's what we have to understand. The goal of preaching in the modern context and throughout history is to hear what God's spirit is saying to his church. That's the goal. And so what happens is we come in to maybe get entertained or inspired, but maybe that's not the mission or intent of Jesus that day. When we see the book of Revelation, we see Jesus walking amongst what we call lampstands, and every lampstand is a city. And when Jesus sees Roseville, he sees the church of Roseville. He doesn't see the rock. He doesn't just see Bayside. He doesn't see destiny or Jesus culture. He sees his church, his ecclesia. And our job is to play one specific part of that puzzle piece and hear, okay, God, you've stationed us at the gates of our city. What are you empowering our people with? What specific message? And again, we know we have people that listen online from around the globe. We have people in Pakistan and Albania that are part of our church here, part of our mission. But again, we're saying, okay, God, right now in this sliver of Roseville, how can we best steward what you're speaking to us? So with all that being prefaced today, I'm asking for permission permission to be nerdy today. Can we be a little nerdy today? Okay. So sometimes we come in and we want to be insp inspired and encouraged, but there are moments when we have to teach. And in modern preaching, we're afraid to teach and to dive into some things. And I will throw a lot of culture and a lot of history at you today and a lot of verses. But again, my spirit is stirred from worship this morning. So who knows? All of it could go out the window. I'm not sure. So at the end, I'm going to have some friends come up and we're just going to pray some general words. I'll open up with the story, but let's just see where the Holy Spirit takes us. And again, message team, I apologize in advance if I'm all over the place with my slides and you don't know what I'm preaching on. So we're going to do the best we can this morning. We good with that church? Are you ready? Okay. So that's my little intro. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, our anchor verse for the series here. Romans 1 16. Again, a lot of verses today. We're not going to be anchored in one passage. So Romans 1 16 says this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Mark chapter 1 verse 15, and Jesus declared, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you again for your presence. We come with expectation. Holy Spirit, speak. Lord, we just ask right now that every burden people came in carrying, we would surrender at your feet. So right now with your eyes closed, you say, you know what? I've been carrying some heavy things in my heart that I need to surrender to Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Holy Spirit, man, a lot of us. 
Just picture yourself handing that to Jesus. God, we, we hand you all the burdens. All those things we're carrying, the fight with our spouse, the abandonment of a parent, the accusation of a friend, finances that haven't shown up yet, delayed provision. Jesus, we say you are enough. You are what we need in this moment. I ask, Holy Spirit, that all the burdens, all the anxiety, all the worry, we surrender at the foot of the cross in Jesus' name. You've been in a place where you're uncertain about your career and where the profession is going to be next, and where God's provision will be for your job. If that's you, just wave your hand at me. Father, we just declare in Jesus' name, provide for your people. Show them where they're meant to be. It's not about the next paycheck, but where's the next assignment that God's leading you to. Lord, we come against the worry of the stock market. We come against the worry of rising interest rates. You're above interest rates, Jesus. You're above the Fed. You're the one we put our trust in. And God, we surrender all that worry for all my real estate agent and mortgage friends right now. We trust you. We thank you for the year of plenty that they've had. But God, we thank you that even in the midst of that, just like you gave Jacob that word to stick a stick in water that created speckled sheep that provided for his family. God, would you give that mystery provision for your people? Holy Spirit, we just pray that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Whatever you have, make your word alive. We thank you, God, that you're going to heal people as you already are right now. You're going to set people free. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you. Get ready. Wake up a little bit. Wake up. How many parents excited for their kids back in school? Come on, Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I love to travel. Any travel fanatics out there with me? We love this overseas. I saw lots of pictures, lots of travel recently. Well, one of the advantages of missions trips is you get to go to places you've never been before and see things no one normally sees. Right, Mike and Jen? Are we right? We get to see some of the coolest stuff. Pastor Bob has a photo library to be envied with all that he's seen and all that he's traveled to. So a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Philippines. The Philippines has over 7,000 islands. Did you know this? 7,000 islands, all of them gorgeous, and we were delivering these lights, solar-powered lights, to these villages that don't have electricity. Well, often when you go overseas, you get requests to bring back souvenirs or unique items for people. Anybody have a unique request that comes from time to time? The most common request is coffee and chocolate. That's it. But on occasion, and it's been asked more than once, I get asked to bring back fake designer purses. It's truth. Especially when you're going to Asian countries, because often those manufacturers are right down the street from where you're going. So when I went to the Philippines, I had a list of fake designer purses I had to pick up for people. Top were Louis Vuitton, and then Michael Kors was the other requested bag at the time. So we go there, and we had kind of a combo trip. We went into the city, and we were doing ministry with businesses and churches, and then we would go out to the islands. So one day we were at this business prayer meeting, and after we had... Um, you know, spoken and, and prayed for different business leaders. I went to the translator and said, hey, I got this list of purses that I need to buy. Is there a place nearby? She says, I know just the place and just where to take you. So she takes me and we go to this market and it is purses are us. It's every purse you can imagine is inside of this marketplace. So as I start to look at things, she's like, no, don't talk to him. He's not honest. And he'll jack up the prices over here, right? She's like, you got to come and see my guy. So we go to the very back and there is this this, this person with the most beautiful long hair you've ever seen in your life. I mean, gorgeous black hair down to the ankles, it almost seemed like. And she introduces me to Eddie. I said, hi there, my name's Brandon. He said, hi, my name's Eddie, but at night you can call me Victoria. I said, okay. All right. So he's the purse merchant. So we're there, and I said, I need this purse. He said, oh, you have this one. And we, he brings out all these array of purses, and he is passionate about your jo his job. Don't you love those people that are passionate about what they do? And he is passionate about purses, right? So I'm there with Eddie, and he's showing me all these purses. But now we're there down to the point where you get to haggle over the price. And I love deals. And I love negotiating. So I'm there, and I'm haggling. And my goal is to get the best deal, right? I want to be able to steward and get the best deal possible. But as I'm negotiating, the Holy Spirit says, you're going to bless him and pay more than what they're worth. I'm like, Oof. 
So we're going, and I negotiate enough where, where I'm not, you know, making them bleed with these different purse prices. And as we're there, uh, we do the price. And I say, hey, you know, Eddie, uh, I was just praying, and God told me to bless you. Here's this extra. He said, no, 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 I can't take this. I can't take this. And I give him a significant amount of money. I said, but hey, as we're here, uh, I just had a quick question. Who's the person working with you? Are you related? And there's this woman with him. He said, well, that's my sister. I said, does she speak any English? And he said, no, not really. I said, can you translate for me? He said, yeah. So he brings her over, and there's my translator next to me. I said, as we were here, I'm a Christian. We're missionaries. And as I was praying, do you have some type of illness in your stomach or pain in your stomach? And he says, no, 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 she doesn't. And as we're there, her eyes go ghost white. And, and then she goes, no, no, no. And she goes with my translator, and she's like, yeah, she had some type of cancer or hernia. We couldn't tell what it was. That was in significant pain. I said, Jesus has brought us here, again, not just to buy purses, but to show his love for you. Can we pray for you? So we're there, and I have, luckily, a female translator with me. When we pray, all the pain goes, and her distended stomach goes back in. And as we're there, I mean, you see Eddie, his eyes light up, right? He's like, what's this? And she's, she begins to cry. I say, hey, Eddie, um, just one other thing. Do you deal with an issue in your hip and your leg? He said, how do you know this? How do you know this? And we said, Jesus speaks. Are you in pain? He said, yeah, I'm in pain right now. He brings up his stool. We pray. Eddie gets healed right there on the spot. As Eddie is there, the Spirit of God comes. He says, you must see my friend. He grabs my hand and runs me through the market. Now, there's all these back, you know, kind of areas, and you get kind of weirded out in these markets, right? So as we're running through this market, he says, here, speak to him. He starts speaking in, in Filipino, right, really, really fast. And he's like, his name's Ricardo. Talk to Ricardo, right? And Ricardo's there. And you could tell, I mean, this entire community lived in alternative life. But guess what? Jesus doesn't mind. His glory and his power can show up in any situation. And as he's there, they need truth. They need hope. I start to pray. So, Ricardo, what's wrong? Turns out he has this jacked up shoulder. We pray, God heals Ricardo's shoulder. Ricardo gets healed. And he says, you have to talk to my other friend. He grabs me. And this is Greg Gregorio or some, whatever his name is. I don't know what his name is. He comes over. Greg's got this back injury. We pray. But as I'm praying for him, again, many of them have transitional lives at night. You can tell. I say, did you have a religious background? He said, yeah. I said, you were a Christian, weren't you? Yeah. I said, some things have been done to you. And you've been taken advantage of. God's coming here not just to heal your back, but to heal your heart. Greg gives his heart to Jesus as his back gets healed. So you're in this moment that became purse shopping, and now all of a sudden revival is breaking out and purses are us, right? So we're there, and, and in these moments, there's no way to describe it. It's like you step into the other. We step into this kingdom world that you can't describe. And this boldness just comes on me. I say, attention everyone. God's healing people in this market, and Jesus is present to heal. If you have any sickness or pain, come and see me right now. Well, as we say this, and again, you, as you're speaking out loud, you're afraid as you're saying it, thinking, what is going on? As I say this, this guy goes, he needs prayer. This guy right next to me. I said, what, what's going on? He didn't speak much English. had the translator. Turns out his mother has cancer, and he's going to visit her right now. So we're going to pray for your mom, but I just get this word of knowledge. I say, but you're, you're Muslim, aren't you? He said, yeah. I said, right now, Jesus is going to reveal his power to you. And although you've been exposed to different things, he is the way, the truth, and the life. We pray for him. I mean, God blows up in this little purse marketplace. All of a sudden, the other translator comes and says, you have to leave. You have to leave right now. The bus is here. The bus is here. So I was like, tell the bus to wait. They say, also, the cops are coming. You have to go right now. <laughs> so we go and we leave this marketplace. And you step out of that market and you literally think, what just happened? What just happened? See, the power of God shows up in ways that we never expect and we never predict. And the problem is we think we have to be these professional ministers in order to see God's power readily available for us. But here's the deal. He purchased it for all of us to have access to. Romans 1.16 says this. I am not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not afraid of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So the Holy Spirit intends to show up in power with his church and set captives free. That there be radical life transformation available to all of us. Now, for us that have been in the church world for a while, we use a lot of terms that the world does not use. And if you're new to church, you're going to hear a lot of phrases. You're like, what on earth does that mean? Have you ever noticed all the strange words we use? Use words like worship, salvation, righteousness, sanctification, propitiation in some of your Bibles. 
And we get these words, and you're like, what does this mean? And I think at times, we become so over-familiar with certain words, we lose their significance and the power that they contain. One of the most common words we use is the gospel. What is the gospel? What does it actually mean? Now, if you look at the basic definition of the word gospel, you'll find that it's Old English and Latin. And it literally means good news or God's spell, good message. Now, here's the deal. All of us receive good news on occasion, right? It's been more scarce these last few years, but we all get some type of good news. When you come home, you share good news that what? You got a raise at work. You share good news that maybe you had good grades at school. We share good news that we slept through the night because our toddler did not wake up. Come on, young parents, are we there? This is good news, but we have to ask the question, is that the intent of the authors of the Bible and what they're writing? Is it simply good news? Is that all it is? See, I would believe that if we just quantify the gospel as good news, we are oversimplifying what Jesus paid for. If it's simply good news, we have that every day. Why is this good news? Why is this gospel so significant? Now, if you look up the term gospel in a New Testament word search, you're going to come across one key passage, and it's an important passage for us to study. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. It says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, this is Paul, in which you received in which you stand. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, buried, and in accordance with the Scriptures. So here we have this basic definition that Paul defines the gospel as Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And he goes on to explain a couple different elements and events that took place afterwards. This is good. This is a good gospel summary, and this is what many would point to. However, I have this question. If that was the gospel, then what gospel did Jesus preach before his death, burial, and resurrection? We often wonder, why is this term gospel used all throughout the gospels when the death, burial, and resurrection is really about 25 verses in each book? Could it be that the gospel is much more than what we've really categorized it to be? Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. See, Paul gives us a slight hint that the gospel is multicultural. The gospel goes beyond just one culture. The other half of Romans 1.16 says this, it's the power of salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. It's really important for us to understand that the New Testament is a fusion of multiple cultures. Now, when we read the Bible, we are so American-centric, we think that the Bible is written in English. Guess what? It wasn't. See, God bless the English language. It is the most confusing language of any culture in the world. See, English is an enmeshment of French and German and Latin and Saxton, all these different things. But we have these simpler languages that were foundational languages in Hebrew and Greek. And the New Testament is written in Greek. And it's 100 generations ago. 2,000 years ago. So we have this term, gospel, that means so much more than what we understand. So it's important for us to know what gospel means both to the Jew and to the Gentile, also to the Greek. And what we do, what we find out is this. The word gospel is the term euangelion. Quite a word, mouthful, right? Turn the person next to you and say euangelion. Look at you, Greek scholars all around. And euangelion is this. It's news of victory or to declare a victory. A little different than simply good news. And when you study this culturally, here's what we find. A messenger comes from the place of battle and declares a victory over enemies or the death of the opponent. This messenger regards himself as the bearer of good tidings. Every messenger from a battlefield came to be called an evangelist. This is what this context is. 
So here's the major concept of a gospel. Is you would have a king win a victory or a strategic battle. They would then hand this decree to a messenger called an evangelist. That would then share the news of victory. So they would first bring this news to the pre-existing cities that surrounded that kingdom. To let them know the battle has been won. That was a gospel. They would then go with an army to declare to the cities that they had won. Or the territories they had established that this is now their land. That's what a gospel was. So they would go with this message. Now, as the gospels continue to move forward, that's the major context of a Jewish gospel is that you would take territory or you would take kingdom. However, the Greeks had a slightly different view of a gospel as well. A gospel was also a battle, but a spiritual fight as well. And believe it or not, in the Greek culture, you would hire these different magicians to expel evil spirits from houses. And so this magician of some type, you would hire him because you believed your house had an evil spirit. They would go in, cleanse the house of evil spirits, and come back with a gospel that the house was free. Isn't that strange? So we have these fusions of two cultures coming together that there is victory in battle both in the practical and the spiritual. That's what a gospel entailed. And both cultures had to fight what they called false gospels. These false gospels would come at times of war because they wouldn't want the enemy to stop fighting. So if your country's losing, they would spread this false gospel to say, hey, don't give up the war. So the way that they would declare that a gospel was true is that they would have a sign of victory. And often that sign of victory was the head or sword of your enemy. Isn't that intense? Very intense. So when this message went through, this gospel went forth, you would come with the weapons of your enemy to prove that they had been defeated. This was the gospel. What we notice in 1 Corinthians 15 is that as Paul goes through these historical events, he closes his gospel discourse with a poem. What does he say? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as this poem would go out, as it would be preached and sung at churches, this symbol of victory emerged in the first century. And the symbol of the gospel and the victory of Jesus was the cross. So Christians everywhere started to write this symbol that Jesus had conquered death and the grave. This was the gospel we began to carry. And this symbol brought forth confidence in the midst of obscurity. And what we notice is this, is that the gospel is simply not just this historical event. The gospel points to the life and fullness of Jesus that is now made available to us. One scholar writes this. The gospel does not merely bear witness to a historical event. It transcends history. Nor does it consist only of sayings concerning Jesus with every Christian should know. On the contrary, the gospel simply does not bear witness to salvation history. It is salvation's history. In the New Testament, Jesus himself is the gospel. He is the content of his message. The gospel of Jesus breaks into the life of man, refashions it, it creates communities, it proves itself to be living power. See, this is what we now have made available to us. A couple years ago, I found out this story. It's called Baseball's First Billionaire. Now, when you think of, you know, sports, basketball, baseball, you think of all these multimillionaires, all these riches. Well, there was this one young pitcher in the minor leagues that got his first contract. He received, I believe, $250,000. And he got noticed that his aunt was going bankrupt. And they had this family property that everybody grew up on. So for $50,000, he purchased back the property from his aunt. So as he's there and he's doing the minor leagues, and they begin to put in some improvements to the property. As they are there, they stumble in that the whole uh, foundation of the house is founded on bedrock. So they bring out these ex- excavators to go and check what exactly was underneath the house. Turns out he's sitting under 10 million tons of quartz. 10 million tons. As they brought out these excavators, they found out he had over $2 billion of rock underneath his grandmother's house that he had now inherited. 
And now his life was to extract this rock and develop and extract the value of what he had just purchased. Years ago, I sat with a mentor. I was 19. And when you're 19, you're trying to prove your worth. You're trying to prove your value. You're trying to impress everybody you talk to, right? Well, I'm with this man. He's in his 70s. Seasoned saint. As we're there, and I'm telling him all these great things, and people getting healed and all this stuff. He says, you know, I've come to discover that our life in Jesus is just discovering the mountain of victory that he's purchased for us and all we now have available. See, this is the picture of the gospel. The gospel is not just a summary of death, burial, and resurrection. See, it is this glimpse of a life in Jesus. As Mark opens his gospel, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, when we think about the term gospel, I want you to expand your concept. It's just like this diamond, right? We love diamonds. We put them on our wedding rings. They're symbols of value. But when you look at a diamond's value, it has many facets. It has many angles as it projects light, right? It's an amazing, amazing stone. But today, I want us to capture over these next eight weeks the different facets of the gospel and what Jesus has made available to us. And as we close here in these next couple of minutes, I want us to capture this one angle of the gospel, and that is the gospel is freedom. Jesus has purchased freedom for you that is now available for you to walk in and see others set free of as well. See, I think we have to begin to understand that we have this power to see captives set free, just as Jesus did. In Luke chapter 4, we get this little introduction to Jesus' gospel. And as he's there, and he has this battle with the devil, he comes out of the wilderness, and Luke uses this unique phrase. He says, and behold, he walked out of the wilderness with the Spirit's power. He comes out of this epic fight. He comes out of this epic temptation. He says, behold, he walks out of the wilderness with the power of the Spirit. Right after this, he begins to go synagogue to synagogue. He goes to these different temples of worship and begins to declare that the gospel of the kingdom, Luke says. But as one day he approaches his hometown called Nazareth. This is a passage familiar for many of us. As he approaches Nazareth, as he walks in, he says it was his turn to read. And often the elders of the city would be the ones that would read from the scrolls of the different prophets or the different Old Testament texts. And as he opens up this text, it says he finds the scroll of Isaiah and he points to a particular passage we know as Isaiah 61. And as he opens up this passage, he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news, gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And to set liberty to those who are oppressed. And declare the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls up this scroll and then he sits down. And he says this controversial statement. Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. What a boss move that is. It's the biggest mic drop moment you can imagine. This passage that they have heard for now hundreds of years. Jesus says, read this, that's me. That's me right there. Now this is the Jesus that they've all known. This is the Jesus that was the carpenter's son. This was the Jesus that ran around the town and now he's declaring that he's the Messiah, the son of God. Things don't add up and they get offended at him and they throw him out of their town. They don't welcome him there. See, here's something we have to understand. Jesus underwent this journey as a human. He emptied himself of the fullness of his deity and walked in a form of it. But as we see him move forward, he continues to get rejected for the transforming power of the gospel that he's walking in. Let me just warn all of you here. When you begin to walk in the fullness that God has for you, the world won't understand it. And those you knew and trusted most may not as well. I think a lot of us think the gospel comes into our life and we can still live our old life and have our old friends. We still think that we can live this old way and still adopt it and bring it along. Listen, there's a complete transformation of the mind that has to take place. 
And what's happened in modern church is we think the gospel can come into us and we continue to live life as business as usual. It doesn't work that way. Normal safe church, normal safe lives, Netflix on the weekends isn't the fullness of the gospel Jesus purchased for you. Your time as you dispose of it. See, this surrendered life, this gospel, think about this. It's the context of a victory of a, of a victory of a king. And by receiving that gospel, you're saying, I surrender my allegiance and property over to you. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, not your consultant and not just your counselor. And in modern therapy, and in modern therapy we pay counselors to hear our problems and not hold us accountable. And a lot of us invite Jesus in as our co-pilot or as our driver's seat. We even sing Jesus Take the Wheel, the dated, amazing Carrie Underwood song. But what does that really mean? See, we want him to take the wheel when we're driving off a cliff. <laughs> Jesus, save me from this destruction that I've caused. That's not the fullness of the gospel. See, Jesus wants to take you on a journey into uncharted land, as Aaron said, that is uncomfortable and improbable, but he's in charge, and you got to trust him. That's the journey of Jesus. And he comes in, and he says this gospel that they're not ready to hear. They kick him out, and what does Jesus do? It says he begins to enter homes. Think about that early term. The magicians would go in and clear evil spirits. He goes into homes and heals the sick and sets the oppressed free. And demons are leaving houses and people. See, the Jewish gospel expectation was a physical king that took over real territory and tangible land. God was after his spiritual inheritance. And that which was lost at the fall, he wanted to restore creation itself. He was after the covenant of his people. I really believe in this next chapter for us as church, as the rock and the church of Roseville and the church of California, we, be begin, we need to start living and beginning to live out that the gospel is setting captives free. We have to live as free people. These last two years, I have seen, and naturally, just we now have statistics, depression and addiction are off the charts right now. It's literally gone up the last two years, 300%. See, before, it was one out of 10 people were clinically depressed. Now it's one out of three. This is a severe depressive state that is contemplating suicide. So right now, when you walk into the mall, you walk into the grocery store, begin to think in kingdom terms, not just your grocery list you hope to leave the store with. Okay? When you go to work, and you're countering opposition, we have to begin to recognize that you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets captives free, and you are the fragrance of life and death, Paul says in 2 Corinthians. So guess what? When you walk into the workplace and you're facing opposition, it's a spiritual battle, my friends. When you wonder yourself, why is my boss and my coworkers always mad and always picking on me? Maybe it's not just about your work performance. It might be. But maybe that's not just it. Maybe it's because there's a spiritual fight that you need to take authority over. And freedom that Jesus wants to bring into those individual lives. And as you go, as you begin to serve, as Sean did an amazing job, serving, washing the feet of those that are against you in the love of Jesus, maybe we'll begin to see those captives set free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, it's really important for us to begin to take the gospel, the goodness of Jesus into our life, the fullness of his message, and say, Jesus, help me live the free life that you paid for. Help me not just live for sin alleviation, shame alleviation, Help me begin to walk in freedom. 
Church, what if the win of your year, when you celebrate January 1st this year, is that thing that you've been struggling with all your life, you actually have victory over and have been set free from? What would you pay for that? What would you invest for that? Here's the beauty. Jesus already did it for you. And now it's our journey of discovery and walking in the freedom that he purchased. This is the beauty of this. I'm gonna invite up a couple of friends to hear pray in just a second. Just one last story. One day I was, uh, my blessed kids, back when they were in car seats, they decided to vomit all in my car. Don't you love those days? And there was vomit everywhere. I'm, I'm going to stop for Natalie so she doesn't gag reflux in the front row. <laughs> but I'm cleaning up this mess. And it was, it was at that stage where everything in the car is irrecoverable. <laughs> You're just not even able to save the stuff. As I'm there, I go down to the blessed laundromat over off of Melody Lane. And I'm waiting there. And I'm like, man, I got an hour to kill. I'm going to go run some errands at Target. So I'm driving over to Target, and as I'm driving over, I see this garage sale. I'm like, man, is that a drum kit in that garage sale? So I get out, and there's this, this gentleman. He's looking through the stuff. He's a younger guy. He's like, is this drum kit for sale? He's like, oh, this isn't mine. I'm just, I'm just looking through stuff. I said, okay. I said, where's the owner? They said, inside. So I go in there, and I said, yeah, this, this stuff is for sale. We're raising kids for our, our money for our kids' uh, camp, their church camp. I said, oh, okay. And as I'm there, I just get this impression that he needs healing. So I begin to ask them questions. I say, hey, do you deal with issues in your back and your knees? He said, oh my goodness. How'd you know this, right? We have this salvation gospel moment where God completely heals this gentleman. And as we're there, he's crying. He says, hey, let, let me go get your number and let, let me get some information on how we can you know, provide for the camp, et cetera. So they go inside. And as I'm there, I get this picture for the guy in front. And he's there and he's rummaging through this stuff. I say, hey, you deal, deal with back issues? He said, No. I said, okay, is there anything I could pray for? Yeah, I got pain in my back right here. I said, okay. <laughs> so as we're there, I see him and he pulls up his hand and on his knuckles is tattooed, tattooed the word suicide. I said, what's that tattoo? He said, oh, nothing. I said, what, what does that say? Oh, nothing. I said, did it say suicide? I said, yeah. I said, where, where are you at with that? He said, I think about it every day. I said, what's your background? And we start talking. Sure enough, grew up in church, living on a friend's couch. And I begin to declare the freedom of Jesus over that individual. And as we're there and we're praying, we're breaking off the spirit of death. It became a lot more than back pain that God healed. It became about freedom for a captive. See, as we carry the gospel as radical lovers of Jesus, we carry the gospel of freedom everywhere we go. And that's what we have an opportunity to walk in and carry. When we start to study the significance of the gospel these next several weeks, I want us to find the different facets. Next week, Sean's going to be talking about gospel as family. We're going to be talking about gospel as fearless, etc. But today, I want you to know the gospel is freedom. It wants to set you free from those practical things that you're struggling in. So let's just stand together as we pray here for a minute. I ask Amy to come up and David and Aaron. I just want us to close our eyes here as we close and just invite the Holy Spirit into those areas of your life. Let's close our eyes here. <laughs> and Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your freedom. God, we ask right now this first Sunday in August that Jesus, you would show up in a significant way. God, we pray for every opposition that we faced. Those things that have bound us. Jesus, would you come and set the minds free right now of all the lies that have been swirling around? Lord, we declare peace in the mind. Jesus, we thank you that the gospel is freedom and that's what you're offering to us now. Again, we understand there are people around us that need freedom, but right now we pray for your people, the church, those in this room, those online. Holy Spirit, just right now with your eyes closed, I want you to invite Jesus 
into your heart, into your mind right now. And just ask him to highlight those things that you're holding on to. Those different things that you've been struggling to break free and get set free from. Right now, Holy Spirit, we pray for freedom in the mind from lust. Or you've been exposed to some, some really dark things. And the enemy continues to bring perversion and guilt into your mind. God, right now we pray for transformation of the thought life in Jesus' name. Freedom where there has been torment over those images. God, we even pray as we shared that last story for those that have been struggling with depression, suicidal ideation. Holy Spirit, we pray for a dramatic transformation of the mind, that they would know that they're made in the image and likeness of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, there's a few uh, things I think the Lord is highlighting that he wants to set some people free from. Y'all don't have to look at me. You can <laughs> engage with Jesus. Um, <clears throat> Two things uh, that I heard pretty specifically. One, I think there's people in here where uh, you have a significant degree of anxiety when you go out in public. Um, if that's you, can you lift a hand for me? It's like, thank you, we've got hands. As I'm calling this stuff out, keep it lifted because we're going to be praying for you here in a moment. Um, so it's significant anxiety when you go out in public. And the other one that I heard um, very clearly was there are some of you here or you've been working on setting boundaries in relationships. But what I heard the Lord saying is that for some of you who have been doing that, your setting of boundaries has been fueled by offense towards people and not towards actually trying to be healthy. So to give you context, you've just been, to call it for what it is, maliciously cutting people off instead of setting boundaries. Um, if, you, if that strikes anything in you, uh, lift your hand because we're going to pray for some freedom here. All right, so if any of that stuff was you, keep it lifted. If you see a hand lifted around you, put a hand on their shoulder, and I'm just going to pray. So Father, right now, in the name and authority of Jesus, we declare that the kingdom of God has come near today. In Jesus' name, we take authority over every spirit of fear, over every spirit of anxiety. And as I'm praying this, just begin to break agreement with that thing, where you've made agreements with stuff in your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, we cancel those agreements. We cancel every agreement we've made with offense. And we command right now peace over minds and peace in hearts and peace in relationships. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> we thank you for more, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Many of us in here know the gospel and the truth that the gospel brings. And we know God's promises and what his word says, but it's stuck in our head. All right. It hasn't come down to our heart because we have a different truth. A truth that does not line up to the word of God. And that is, even though we know in our head it's a lie, it's our personal truth. And what Holy Spirit wants to do today is he wants to take that lie, that false truth that we know and have in our heart. And he wants to replace it with his truth. And if you want his truth to replace that lie in your heart so that you can receive full healing. Um, prayer team, I want you forward. I want you to come and just uh, really receive prayer over that false lie so that we could replace it with the truth of God's word. <clears throat> so as I was uh, just worshiping and praying earlier, I kept seeing the same picture repeat over and over again, and the word was trust. And it was a trust fall, but people were breaking their falls, right? So you would, instead of just falling straight back, 
you would kind of like sit on your butt and then fall, right? And so what I felt the Lord was saying was there's people in this room, people watching online, people that we know that are trying their absolute best to trust the Lord with an opportunity, with an idea, uh, just with some sort of creative thing you want to take action with. Uh, nonetheless, it's about trusting the Lord fully as his living sacrifice because he freely gave us all of that. And so I just pray for, for everyone here who is trusting the Lord with something to not hold back and to give it all and in turn receive freely. One last word here, and then we'll pray. As uh, Brandon was preaching, I saw um, Sam's guitar and his strap. It says, get back, and it was facing out. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. And looking at it on him, it's over his shoulder. And it goes along with Amy's word about our thoughts and taking our thoughts captive and walking in freedom. Mm -hmm. We want that. Sometimes it's harder to do when things are coming at us and like the bombarding of every day, every thought, every word we hear. And he's like, no, it's like it comes in and we just got to surrender. We got to surrender and we're taking it and we're putting on our shoulders. Get back. We got to give it back to God. Release it to him because we have authority to stand and that's what we have to be, that's what we are called into is to stand. When we take our thoughts captive, we have the authority to speak truth and bring healing. So right now, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for the power you give us. We thank you for the word of the gospel, Lord, of who you are, of what you're doing, Lord. We thank you. Just with eyes closed here. Holy Spirit, we come against every lie. Because that's this major theme right now. Just eyes closed. You are dealing actively with lies of the enemy. As Amy and Jen share, if that's you, lift your hand up right now. Holy Spirit, we declare freedom where those, those lies that are coming in. We take every thought captive and declare freedom, Holy Spirit. That you are provider, that you are king, that you are God that loves and cares and sees your children. Lord, we ask for that orphan spirit to go. The spirit of adoption would be present. That we have a father that loves us that cares for us, that's invited us into his family. Lord, we pray for those that are needing to take the trust fall. They're needing to take that leap of faith, that they would not be afraid to step and lean into the promises that you have for us. The Holy Spirit, we thank you. We welcome your presence. We celebrate your goodness this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, give a shout out to Jesus, church. Come on.